Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. We're very fortunate today to have uh, Robert Constable here to join us. He's the Dean of Cornell's Faculty of Computing and Information Science. Uh, he's a unique individual in many ways. Uh, you'll find him to be quite personable. Um, he's one of the deans that we have that's maintained a strong research focus. Uh, he's been a professor at Cornell for 37 years, um, uh, worked with 40 PhD students, has three books on formal methods, and uh, still leads a research group in automated reasoning and formal methods that uses the new Perl theorem prover. And um, some of his uh, background, which uh, by these days is not as important as his foreground, uh, is that he did his PhD at the University of Wisconsin with Steve Klein. Kleine. Yeah. So with that, I would like to welcome Robert Constable. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Harold. So welcome to the intimate audience in the room and those of you around the company. So we're going to talk um, here about distributed systems, about formal methods, and about <clears throat> a new logic for reasoning about distributed systems that we're calling the logic of events. This work is joint with my colleague Mark Bickford, who works for ATC New York. So the, the plan is, um, oops, okay, the plan, is that, there we go, is to um, have a brief introduction to the whole subject and then talk about these event structures, which are the key elements that the logic of events reasons about, and then illustrate how this very abstract logic can be brought down to earth in the sense that we can synthesize protocols, correct protocols from proofs about how to achieve specifications of concurrent um, tasks. So the introduction I had in mind was this one, but let me try um, a different introduction for Microsoft here because I think um, you all have an approach to formal methods that is as broad as that of any organization I know. No university can be as broad as you all are. The federal government's view of what formal methods is is not as broad as yours. So I, I want to approach the subject from that very broad point of view at first. So I, I think of the university's job here is to think about where formal methods are going on the 20-year time horizon. What might we be able to do 20 years from now? And you all are working on the problem from what can we do today to what do we do maybe 10 years out. And there's a good intersection that I want to talk about in that is out five to seven year time frame. And I think you're, you're, because of the orientation of Microsoft as a company and Microsoft research in particular to science generally, I, I'm hoping this audience will be receptive to the kind of abstract view I want to take of the subject. So let me say this about distributed computing and the way it relates not only to understanding network computing systems, but to understanding problems in science, in biology, in immunology, and possibly in physics. So you all have produced this wonderful study that I was talking to Harold about earlier called Toward Science 2020. Have any of you read it yet? It's really, I think, one of the best documents about the future of computer science vis-a-vis -vis the sciences. This is, a, this is a document that says computer science is adding fundamental concepts that are going to shape science in the year 2020. And I think one of the areas in which we're adding these fundamental concepts is in formal methods. Now, a lot of people think of formal methods as just a way to make systems more reliable. You all think that way, too. But you also think about it as a subject that might inform how we think about distributed computing in the large, in its most general form. 
So for example, we, we, we have a hint that the cell is a giant distributed computing system of some kind. We don't thoroughly understand it. We, we know that it doesn't run Windows. We know that it's not using abstract state machines. But, but not yet, says Uri. But we know that it's, a, it's some kind of a distributed computing environment. And we'd like to be able to describe that so, and, and start to reason about it without knowing exactly what the code base is. So we want to, I think, we want a language about distributed computing that's very abstract, that allows us to say something about occurrences of distributed computation in science. So this approach is going to be very abstract. We're not going to specify, uh, we're, we're not going to start with code and add assertions, which is a common way of doing reasoning about distributed computing. And, and this is a way that it, back in 1975 we were heavily into with our PLCV system where we used PL1 code and we annotated it. But instead, we want to just think about specifying a distributed behavior. So that's what these event structures are going to be about. So let me tell you a little about those, but I'll it's going to seem so abstract. You're going to say, well, this, this might be uh, good philosophy uh, or good theory of computing, but it couldn't possibly be relevant to getting Windows better, to improving Windows locking protocols. So in the end there, in, in uh, part three of the talk, I'm going to show you that we didn't get way out of the world. We didn't get too abstract. We can, in fact, take these ideas and generate with them particular protocols, even Windows locking protocols. I can't go into that, and I wouldn't dare do that in this environment, but I'll give you an, an interesting distributed protocol for leader election and show you how we can synthesize leader election protocols from proofs about these event structures. Okay, so that, I hope that keeps you uh, interested in them. So, and maybe another way to ground this, to let you know that we didn't start off in the sky. This wasn't a theory that originated from just pondering what is a distributed <coughs> system. We actually got there. I, w I wish we had gotten there that way, by, by the way. Because uh, Glenn Winskill, whose work I'll talk about from the 80s, he did have a vision that was based on that kind of thinking. We got there the hard way, crawling through uh, verifications of protocols. So we've been working with the distributed systems group at Cornell, Ken Berman, Robert Van Renesse, many PhD students like Mark Hayden, trying to verify the protocol stacks in systems like Ensemble and Horus that are pretty widely used. So right now on Wall Street, the uh, Horus system is used to manage the trading room screens. And um, the military uses Horus in its um, Navy-based command and control systems. And the French air traffic control system, um, which now they're routing everybody around, I discovered as I was coming back from Europe. We now fly over the Mediterranean because of work stoppages. But when that system is running, they're running code in the protocol stacks from this system on uh, Horus. So we started working on verifying these micro protocols using different formalisms like IO automata at first and trying to get formal met methods injected at the design stage. So when people were starting to design the protocols, we wanted to be there rather than at the end when they've got it all written and they're asking us to show that it's correct. So the reason, the way we got to be abstract was to try to inject ourselves early into the process of building reliable distributed systems. So um, you're going to see a logic that's here at this high level of abstraction. But we can now take these uh, proofs about the achievability of a specification and actually convert the proof to running Java code. And uh, by the way, I'd like to talk to Microsoft about making it C-sharp code and being part of the spec-sharp uh, uh, activity. 
But right now, we can actually generate running Java code that's automatically synthesized from the proofs about these distributed systems. So it's, it's real. It's grounded in actual demos. And um, uh, we could give you a demo of that, but we don't have time for it. But at the abstract level, here's what we're saying. We're talking about um, distributed computing at the level of, of, of observing events in time and space. And this is the kind of approach Leslie Lamport took in, this, in the 70s, right? He was thinking, based on his experience as a physicist and uh, thinking about relativity theory, he was thinking about the nature of time in distributed computings, and he came up with his fundamental notion, this Lamport clock, the idea that time is causal order. And we've adopted that. That's time. Time in this system is Lamport's causal ordering. And what is space? Well, space is the collection of processes that are interacting with each other. And we think of them that way as space or as locations rather than agents in this very abstract view to um, not only to suggest this connection to physics, but really when you think about what is an agent at its most abstract level, for us it's a place in space where things happen. It's a locus of activity. And in fact, for us, it's a locus of activity. A particular location is a locus of sequential activity, where things can be sequentialized. And the nature of interaction, then, is that these locations communicate with each other. And the logic that we're going to talk about is a logic of two kinds of actions local actions in these synchronous events at a location, and the actions of sending and receiving messages. We're actually going to focus on receiving because every event, whether it's local or um, a message transfer, can actually send a message. OK, so that's the setting then. Um, Lamport style approach, but also focusing not on uh, not only on time, but on these locations and on events, the things that happen. And as I said before, Glenn Winskel in 1980 was talking about a logic of events where he was abstracting from Petri nets. And he came to a similar view where events are the key characters in the logic. OK, so here are some of the distinguishing features that I just talked about, based directly on Leslie Lamport's insights. Um, it's the language that the distributing that, that the designers of distributed computing systems at Cornell were using when they talked to each other. And we ended up uh, formalizing this whole theory and integrating it into our logical programming environment. So the theory I'm about to show you has been completely formalized. Every theorem, every definition, and, and it, the formal theory amounts to about 3,000 objects, definitions, theorems, and um, tactics. OK, but now I'm, I'm going to show you the um, I'll gradually unfold this theory in a way that I hope will be extremely accessible. So you'll be able to learn. You can actually learn this thing in real time. We, we boiled the theory down to something very simple. So we're going to start with um, events and an order relation. So it's just events and how they relate to each other. And then we'll continually refine, continue to refine the model. So the basic structure here we call events with order. And it's very algebraic. You, you can think of this as we've got two types, the type of events, the type of locations, and just two functions, a predecessor function and a sender function. So the only um, qualification here is that these types have to be discrete. That is, you can decide whether two events are equal, whether two locations are equal. So the, remember, these locations are the, are the agents. So you can decide whether you've got two agents that are the same. And you can tell whether events are, are at, the, uh, <clears throat> at, at what location they, uh, they uh, occurred and whether they're equal events. Now this, um, this function here, the predecessor, tells you what event 
came before the event you're looking at. Now, it could come before it either in the sequential ordering at the location, so it could be just a prior event in a sequential computation, or it could be uh, the sender of an event. And we'll get that down here. Now, with a predecessor, if you make the type of it general like this, you say, well, it's going to map into the previous event, or if there isn't a previous event, it'll map to the, lo to the location. You can then get kind of two bits of information for one out of here. Not only do you get the previous event, but you get the location. And that, that's just a cute fact. And likewise, uh, with a sender, you can find out the previous, um, you, you can find out who sent you the, uh, a message if that is, if the event is a receipt of a message, or you can tell that there was no sender and this is a first event. Okay, so from, from those simple functions and these axioms about them, which I won't go into in much detail, you can read them here. We say the predecessor function is injective. Um, the key, this axiom is probably worth talking about. We can define a predecessor relation here, which I labeled L for Lamport. X is Lamport less than Y, um, defined this way. Either X is the predecessor of Y, the sequential predecessor, or X is the sender of Y. And what we uh, stipulate here is that this relation has to be strongly well-founded. That is, there is a function <clears throat> from the natural numbers into that ordering. So here's the function f. And given that, we're going to be able to prove that causal order is well-founded, strongly well-founded. Yeah, or That's right, exactly. And so we're assuming in this communication model that the channels are reliable and FIFO. And if we want something else, we can inject, for example, if we don't want them to be reliable, we can put an agent on the link and have that agent drop the messages or scramble them. So this, this isn't a, um, a, a restriction in terms of uh, the kind of models we can, we, we can look at. The other thing to notice, even though I'm trying to stay very abstract, what you should bear in mind is that an instance of this whole logic is going to be the standard asynchronous communication model used in distributed computing. So the locations are going to be processes that are sending messages on reliable FIFO links asynchronously. So the model in Atia and Walsh is exactly the model we're, we're going to get out of this abstract logic. Okay, as I mentioned before, then we can squeeze some more information <clears throat> out of these functions. So we can have a function that's the location of an event. Of an event. It maps <clears throat> uh, events to locations. You can decide whether the event is the first event. You can tell whether an event is a receive. You can define causal order, Lamport's order relation. And um, you can also define the local order if you restrict causal order to a particular location we subscript it there as uh, eloc let's see if i can move that there it is the less than sub lock okay and uh, it turns out that uh, a natural way to th um, a, a diagram that captures what's going on here is this kind of message sequence diagram that you see on the boards of protocol designers you can spot you know, a, a data structures person by the number of trees they have on the board. You come in, you say, oh, look at all those trees, colored red and black and so forth. You want to know by just glancing in an office, is this a protocol designer? You look for these message sequence diagrams, right? What comes before what? So in that uh, setup, here are the locations. We've got three locations. The events are these circles. So some of the events are, say, the receipt of a message. Other events occur just in the computation at that location. Here we have sends. And uh, typically, the, the kinds of mistakes people make is not having a rich enough diagram when they're trying to understand the protocol. OK, so now what's going to happen here, if we, if we want to get to the full mature theory, we extend this very simple algebraic structure. You could hardly be simpler, right? Just two data types and two functions. 
we progressively extend this to events with uh, value, and then events with state, and then we define the communication topology that connects the various locations. Finally, we can add real time, and when we want to reason about security, we can actually talk about the transition function at each one of the locations. So I'm, I'm going to say a little bit more about these things, and when I do, um, you'll have to note one, here's a non-standard, not, I don't think it's so non-standard, but it's a bit of notation you might not be familiar with. If we want to describe the set of functions from A to B, that's what we do up here, A arrow B. Those are the computable functions from any type A to type B. Down here, this is the set of computable functions from A to B of X, where the range type depends on the value of the function here. So if a function f is in that type, then when you supply an argument a to f, the value will be in the type b of a. So a standard example is to define um, a data type for the date, where the month maps not just to, say, 31 days for every month, but you can isolate the right number of days. If we want to make this really exact, we'd add the year there, right? So you could factor in leap year. So we're going to need that little bit of notation here when we describe the, uh, this kind of E state here. When we get to E state, you'll see we use that dependent type. But we've discussed already up there E order. And the next thing we want to do in a progression of enriching the logic is to say that every one of these events could have a value associated with it. Now, for um, a message send event, the value is just going to be the message that was sent. So that's easy. But to make this uniform, we want to associate a value also with the internal actions. And even before we get to the idea of state, this makes sense. So you could, for instance, have the internal action doing picking a random number or something like that. So we want to be able to associate, we do associate values even with the internal actions. So there are events with value, then we have this additional function value that takes an event and maps to a value determined by the location of the event and the kind of the event, whether it's internal or external. Okay, and then to make this um, more concrete, we get to the notion of events with state. And here we have to introduce a new type of identifiers, the kind of identifiers you see in programming languages. So these are just the names of locations in the state. They're all typed, so given um, an identifier and a location, you can say what the type of that value is. And we'll see a lot of examples of this. And at the level of state, we're going to introduce three temporal operators, initially, when, and after. So if you want to say what the um, value of the state is initially, that's determined by this function. And for the when and after, we've got these temporal operators. You can say when an event E occurs at a location, um, the value of that variable, uh, the variable x here, will be in this type. And then you can describe state changes by saying after that event E happens, the value of this variable will be this type. So we've now got a, a way of talking about the progression of values of a variable over events, as, as events happen. Yeah, Rick? Multiple threads. Yeah. Right. So in order to capture that model, and we had a, an interesting discussion at TechFest. Uh, oh, yeah. Let me repeat Uri's question. So he says, in, um, in this model, agents are sequential. But in the Java model and the C-sharp model, agents can have multiple threads running. So active events there are not sequential. The way we model that 
is to say that a, jo a Java program will actually have multiple agents in that location. And this, this is a pure view, a, a pure view, but it's one that when I was talking to the singularity people, they said, yes, we, we probably would have wanted to start with a pure view like this and build up to the idea of a thread-based agent. So we can certainly do that. Uh, we've just taken here a more primitive view, uh, a more axiomatic point of view. But that, that is a key difference. OK, so um, with every one of these uh, new functions we add here, we get cap the capability of defining other, um, uh, other functions, like in the case of the topology, when we actually talk about the communication channels here, we're going to be able to describe the source and destination of a link. And we can talk about the messages that are being sent on a link. So here we'll get the, um, the messages can be tagged. So you can say what kind of message. If you're doing leader election, you might want to tag your voting messages with a uh, label called this is a vote. And so the, the type of the um, a data being sent there is determined by a function that takes the link and the tag of the message and gives you the type. All right, so that's probably enough type theory for anyone, for a general audience. But I think you'll find there that that's compact anyway. You can see that's pretty much the whole theory. The typing isn't that obtrusive, just a one dependent function concept we had to introduce here. Otherwise, everything is pretty standard. Does that look all right? OK, so I was going to say more about that, but I think everybody is with me here. So let's go into um, a sample specification. What can we do in this language? So we'll take something incredibly simple first, and then later get to something like leader election. And I think even though this is a, you know, you're going to say, well, why do we have to see this thing again, two-phase handshake? There is something interesting here at the end. Maybe it'll come out in a question. This is actually interesting. So let's say we want to specify a two-phase handshake, a very basic protocol in every kind of distributed system. So S is going to, the sender is going to send a message to the receiver R who will acknowledge it before another message is sent from S to R. So we're going to specify what that means in a minute. But let's notice how we can uh, capture these ideas uh, uh, really in a elegantly in a standard mathematical notation. So here we're describing the set of events <clears throat> at a location P. So those are all the events E such that, such that the location of E is this particular process P. And then we can talk about the sends, the send events at E of P. Those are the events where the list of messages sent on a link L is not empty. Those are the send events, and here are the receive events. OK, so that's, that's a step you would hope we could uh, carry out, an elegant description of those uh, subsets of events. Whoa, <laughs> something happened there. That's interesting. So the font got screwed up, but I think we'll be able to read this anyway. That little funny sign that didn't get loaded there is an existential quantifier. Uh, it's not supposed to be a temporal operator. It just didn't. Yeah, it's an exists. I don't know what happened to it. I've never seen that font uh, materialize. Anyway, let's, let's try to describe what we want to have happen, say, at um, the sends events on the link L1 connecting S and R. Here we want to say, well, and that guy there, that should be a comma. So this should say, for every event, E1 and E2, that are send events from S to R, there should exist an event R that's a receive at S on L2, the link coming back, such that if, L1 is, uh, if E1 is less than E2, then the uh, acknowledgment there sits between. Them. So the, the nice thing about th this specification is it's trivial. Anybody can read it. If you know what quantifiers are, you just look at that thing and say, oh, yeah, OK, I know what they want. There are, there are no funny temporal operators. Everything is standard. Of course, here, there, there are some funny symbols. But if you had the right symbols, 
this would be really easy to read. And, and it corresponds to the message sequence diagram. There's E1, there's E2, E1 sent over here to R, R, acknowledge, uh, R sent a message that gets received at, at S. Okay, so <coughs> what we'd like to do is, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you the interesting thing about this. Here's an interesting fact. If, if we can prove these two theorems, then what we're doing is establishing a correspondence here between the sends and receive actions between S and R. So you can set up a mapping that says, for every uh, send event here, there's going to be the receive. And for every receive, there's a map in the other direction. So you can set up a one-to-one -one correspondence between S and R and show that your proof that this kind of activity uh, is achievable is also a proof that there is a mapping between S and R. And this is the kind of thing that's much harder to express in something like temporal logic, even in temporal logic of actions. Um, OK, so just uh, to remind you again what the computation model is that we have in mind, because now we're going to start talking about extraction. Here's a very simple example of a bunch of locations, five processes, five locations. At every one there, you've got a state, you've got the action being taken, and you've got the message queue that's built up <clears throat> between uh, one process and another. So you can label these um, message queues. And the computation proceeds not by interleaving these computations, but just imagining that at every one of these locations, there's a transition function that takes you from this state here, say at location one, state one, action one, message one, to a, at the next time step, another state S1 prime, another action A1 prime, and another message queue. And these uh, state transitions may in fact be null. Maybe nothing happens here while other processes are proceeding. And even though when I'm describing that computation model, I'm using time here as a series of discrete events, this time parameter is not part of the logic. This is just to give you a concrete model of how computation proceeds underneath. Right? It's the standard Atia and Welsh computation model. So um, maybe I don't have to say much about that either. Let me just go on. This and uh, even go beyond this because we've already talked about it. Although may, maybe there's one point here. Uri already mentioned that these channels are fair. Um, I just mentioned that there are the null actions. Another thing to notice is that we build in fairness into the computation scheme. So the uh, computation that we just described there has to make sure that it infinitely often examines all the possible actions that are waiting. So it checks. Message receives and actions. Yep. Yes, that's an axiom. That's in the very basic structure, uh, event structure. It's nothing we have addressed yet. So can we deal with the design of reliable channels in this model? Would that be? Right. Getting good throughput. Yes. So. The systems group is very interested in those questions, reliable throughput. And when, when they design protocols, they also do an analysis of what kind of throughput do we have in this model. Now, they haven't asked us to reason about that, but I see no reason that we couldn't. So you know, we can make the channels um, unreliable. We can deal with fault-tolerant processing. And we can also start to measure by adding you notice we've got very detailed uh, control now because we can talk about state transitions. So we can, and we can talk about the number of messages on a channel. 
So we can talk about issues like that. What is the uh, uh, cost of message traffic to achieve a certain spec? So you won't see any examples of that here, but in principle, we could talk about that rather well. I think. Yeah, in fact, the number of problems we have to work on here vastly exceeds our manpower to deal with them. So we've been focusing on, here, here's how we get to problems in, in our environment. The distributed systems group will be designing something, and they get into trouble. They're designing recently an adaptive protocol that was switching the consensus methods on the fly. And they had sketched it out, and they were trying to convince themselves it was right. So they came to us and said, we, we don't, uh, we're not so sure. Could you do something? Could you specify this? So we spec'd it for them. We had long discussions at the board with these message diagrams. We, they understand our formalism. They said, yeah, that, that looks right. Now can you prove anything about it? Because we've got this whole theory formalized, Mark Bickford could sit down and try to prove some basic properties while they put a graduate student on writing the code. So the student would write the code. We'd do the proof. We'd meet in a week. And we'd talk about it. And in one case, um, and this was a decisive moment in our interactions with them, we found a, um, a bug in the thing. It, it, it just didn't, didn't work and found a way to correct it. So when we came in, we said, your code doesn't work, right? And they said, right. Here's the bug, and here's how to fix it. That led to um, another decisive moment when once we had all this capability around, we could look at while, while they were out designing protocols that they thought they really understood, we were looking at some of the things they had done in the past that were challenging. And we found a Horus protocol that we detected a bug in that had been running in, in their Well, they claimed they had eventually fixed it. But they came in to t we came to talk to them and said, hey, this protocol there, it's got a bug in it. And we showed them the message sequence diagram that revealed the bug. And they thought, we were really getting good. They said, how'd you guys do that? That's, that's pretty good. That was at a stage when the students who were talking to us didn't understand that New Pearl is incredibly meticulous. right? So it's the thing that found the error for us. But that shows you the mode we're in. We haven't been brought in to um, analyze message traffic and real efficient use of channels. A certain kind of behavior, right? Yes. But we could, you know, in the case of functional programming, we can analyze the computational complexity and design algorithms that have certain specified complexity behavior. And that would be possible here, too. We could say what kind of message traffic, what kind of runtime do we want? We have for functional programs. Here we haven't. But you notice the whole theory of functional programming gets incorporated here because we, we've got general functions. When you see the uh, message automata that we come up with in a few minutes, you'll see that state transitions are arbitrary computable functions in this model. And that means we can assign complexity to them. We can talk about the computational complexity of that state transition. Yeah, for it. So worry for the rest of the audience, the remote audience, is suggesting that there might be a way to raise the level of abstraction here on fairness so that we don't have to um, talk about um, examining all the uh, waiting actions and, and 
message buffers infinitely often. And I, do, I see what you said, but we'll have to talk more about that to understand how we could put it in here. Because our, our current model is that you know, messages are sent and, and you can't, there's no precondition on the receipt. If it's in the buffer, bang, you know, when, you get, when, when the buffer is examined, you have to read it. So we have problems of buffer overflow, and that gets back to the previous question. We have to deal with what happens to the, to the buffers in this model. That we can reason about. But th this would be an extremely interesting point to talk about. All right, well, let's see if we can get into extraction here. We've got only about 10 minutes, and I'll try to tell you something about how we um, connect proofs to running code. For that, I have to use at least this one uh, kind of logical template here to tell you the way, we, the way things work. In general, we're trying to prove specification. So here's a simple one. For every x of type A, there's a y of type B such that some relationship holds. And in the case of um, doing sequential program extraction, that kind of specification <laughs> will define a function from A to B. And we get the function by synthesizing, um, a, by synthesis from a proof that we develop top down. So the proof actually leads to an extraction of code here, which is going to be a function. The code is extracted by looking at subproof. So here, in order to prove this, maybe we have to prove with, new, with hypotheses H1 some goal G1, and another, from another set of hypotheses, we prove another goal is achievable. We extract G1 and G2 from those subproofs, put them together, and get uh, an extract an extraction for this. So the method of building code is to start with a specification and break it down by refinement, showing that all the sub-goals are achievable, and then building back up to the top with a program or a function. We're going to do the same thing for distributed computing. Wow, we, we lost our existential quantifiers, so I think I won't stay on this topic. I'll show you an example of it. But essentially, for distributed computing, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to start with a specification of a system. Like, let's, let's do it for this one. It's, this is incredibly simple, and then we'll get to a harder example. Here's a theorem, right, that for all these, and, and we've got good existential quantifiers here. Whoops. OK, so here's the theorem. It says for all E1 and E2 that are sends, if E1's less than E2, we can find this receive action between them. So let's see if we can just prove this theorem in a way that will lead to code. So when you look for the consequences, what are the consequences of this assumption, E1 less than E2? Well, S sent two messages. Can we infer anything more about this? To do that, you can think that we're, we're going to um, have to design a, some kind of a proof. And the design of the proof here is going to be informed by an insight into how protocols are designed. We'll say, let's relate these send messages to uh, properties that we can track with a Boolean variable called ready. So if we require that ready has to be true when a send event occurs, and then stipulate that ready should be set to false after the send event occurs, with those two stipulations, we know something more here. We now know that um, after this send, E1, after E1, the um, value of ready is going to be false because we made that stipulation. And uh, since, OK, so here, here we say that. Since E2 is a send event, ready must be true by the time we get to E2. So some event, E prime, between E1 and E2 must have set ready to true. That's just a little bit of logical reasoning here. Now we can stipulate one more in, in a lemma that the only way you can change ready from false to true is to have a receive come on the link back from R. So let's state those things as lemmas here. So there are three lemmas in blue. The first one says, after ready, after the event E, which is ascend, will be false. This one says that ready 
uh, when SN event occurs will be true. And this one down here says the only events that change ready from true, that <coughs> actually changes ready to true, will be a received link uh, from R. So if you have those three facts, you can then easily finish the, the proof of, of the theorem. And now let's see, how do you achieve those three facts? Well, it's pretty trivial how we, how we can receive them. Let's just, I mean, how we can uh, achieve them. So let's look here at uh, two. How do we achieve this, that <clears throat> ready after this event or when the E is true? Well, we require a precondition on any action for, um, uh, let's see, require the precondition on the action A that if you're, it, but before you can set ready to false, you have to have this precondition that ready is equal to true. And then this will also be a precondition on, on the send event. So we can design this kind, we, we see how we can write code to enforce this kind of logical assertion here. This is the logical assertion. This kind of code will enforce it. So let's see, we have probably one more. Yeah, this, this example is a little more subtle. Um, how do we guarantee that the only kind of actions that can change ready from false to true are these, uh, say, is the receive? Well, we stipulate that with something called a frame condition that says only certain actions, A and B, can affect this variable ready. And then when you look and see that, well, one of the actions, A, can only change ready from, from true to false, you look and see, well, what's, what does the other action, what, what's this other action B, the only other one that can affect it, and that's the receive of a message from R. So these things here that we call frame conditions are going to be a key part of our synthesis of, of programs. So here is the little automaton that gets built. This thing is called a message automaton that gets built from actually proving two kinds of things. One, that those three lemmas I stated can each be realized, each proved. And you can actually see the lemmas right here in this code. For every lemma, there's a little piece of the code. And we then know that from those three lemmas, we can prove the specification um, of the two-phase handshake. Okay, does that make general kind of sense? So when, when you prove the lemmas, you can think of those lemmas as a decomposition of the problem into things until you, you keep decomposing until you reach lemmas that you know how to achieve with little automata, with little tiny pieces of automata. And then the composition turns out to be incredibly trivial here. Notice there's no composition operator when we put these together. We just took the clauses from those lemmas and you took a union of them, which is kind of amazing. It means composition in this theory of message automata is union of clauses. And why can we do that? It's because of these frame conditions. These give us something that I think in IO automata, and we'll have to talk about whether in distributed state machines, wh whether this kind of composition is uh, <coughs> feasible. But what, what makes it feasible here is that instead of saying exactly how uh, two sub-automata are linked port to port, we're just saying what, um, what properties have to be protected, what infer interference possibilities have to be ruled out. And that gives us an incredibly simple composition mechanism. So these are our abstract state machines for us. These are distributed abstract state machines. And uh, the composition of them, as I said, is a very straightforward thing. Now, if you compare this to uh, TLA plus specifications for the same problem, I think you find that here, this to me is much less readable than what we were saying about th this is Leslie's specification of the two phase handshake. And there you have to build in, well, first the typing, you know, <laughs> Leslie disagrees with us a lot on typing, but the typing invariants have to be stated there and proved as part of the logical properties. But um, I think this is a, a more 
a, a less intuitive and certainly less abstract specification because in this model, you have to have already agreed that the computations you're going to be looking at will be interleaved sequences, right? So you have uh, all the possible execution sequences put together in a stream. And while that's been incredibly effective for model checking, it's not the model that is generated from a top-down intuitive view of what we're trying to achieve with specifications. Um, no, I, I don't know whether we can characterize it that way. So, um, so we, there are a couple of things he did that we don't do, uh, but we were inspired by him, you know, picking the set of messages, uh, events as primitive. And, and also the interference idea is in there, but in a different way, right? So he, he had these events are incompatible. Well, we deal with that through these um, at the level of message automata where we say the constraints, the frame conditions, might be contradictory. So um, let me just say perhaps uh, more briefly about this. We, I'm happy to go into a, lo a lot of detail if you want, because I have the whole proof specified. But let's look at a more significant uh, problem, say leader election in a ring of processes. So probably everyone is familiar with that, uh, that al algorithm, right? Most of you are familiar. But I'm hoping you won't be familiar with this way of specifying it. So typically, the way this is specified in textbooks is you dream up the algorithm. So the, the one we're going to talk about is the um, standard uh, LSR algorithm, where you just every process sends its user ID around to its neighbor. And when a process receives a user ID, it looks to see whether that ID is bigger than its own. If it is, it passes it on. If it's not, it blocks it. And a process will be declared a leader if it gets its own user ID back, because it then knows that there's nothing in the ring that has a higher process ID than it. And typically, that's presented by giving the algorithm first, saying, well, there's the algorithm. And now you write down some assertions about it. And uh, one of the assertions has to be that if you get your own user ID, you know you're, you have the maximum user ID, and that's who's going to be elected leader. And how do you know that? Well, you say, OK, uh, if I get my own ID back, then I know that there's no downstream process that blocked it. So there's no other um, process in the ring that has a higher user ID than mine. OK, so that, that's a perfectly fine way to go, but it starts with code. You have to dream up the algorithm first. And the question is, could you specify this first at a pretty high level and then prove something about the specification and perhaps derive exactly that algorithm? And indeed, you can. So I'll write down the specification here and uh, describe the theorem and describe what comes out. And then if you want, we can do some details. So what we first have to do is describe what it means to have a leader election problem. Thanks, Uri. Maybe we can uh, chat more, because I'd love to. No, no, I, I know you had to leave for a seminar. But maybe we can talk about your I idea there sometime. I'm having. Lunch here in this room until in this room until one with a Cornell alum, and we'll declare you an honorary Cornell alum for an hour. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Okay, so here, here you've got a, a quick specification that R is a ring, so you just specify how the links are connected. Then you have an event system here that we're parameterizing by this by, and we're going to say that. You've specified it right if there is a process that declares itself to be a leader. That is, there exists something, a, a location, LDR, in the ring, such that there is an, an event at leader that says, I am the leader. And, er, and then we also stipulate that for every other I, 
agent in the ring, if it says it's the leader, then it has to be this particular guy, this leader. Okay, now that's pretty abstract. We don't have an algorithm in sight, right? No protocol in sight, just a condition. And the way our um, system works is we generate this kind of a theorem, that for every ring with these properties, there exists a distributed system over the ring that's feasible, that can be executed, such that for every event system arising from that distributed system that's consistent, or that's consistent with it, it will satisfy this specification up here of leader. Yes. So when you, um, yes, if, when you ask the thing right, to elect a leader, to, th th this is actually going to show that we can create an event system here where there is a leader. So it, it, once we've installed that, yes, there will, there will be a leader. Oh, that if, so this says we can, so now, now you're trying to say, can we get a system where you can elect leaders? So what we're saying is, yes, there will exist a distributed system <coughs> in which there will be uh, agents yeah. that can elect mm -hmm. leaders. So now that depends on how you want to use it. So now you're knowing, okay, I can build a distributed system that will elect leaders. And this is kind of an isolated piece. You may want to put that together with other components. And one of them might say, at this point, we need to elect a new leader. And you'll, what you'll know is you've got that capability. There sits this theorem, and associated with it will be the message automaton that can be affected. So we're not talking about how this gets used right now, but just that we can create that. We can build a distributed system with that capability. Not clear. So you, you can imagine doing this. So remember, we're in this environment where we were typically building uh, little micro protocol stacks where we need a, a lot of capabilities. So this shows how to get all the capabilities you might want. And there, there would be an interesting question about um, consistency of adding a lot of other ones. So here we're doing it in isolation. I can build you this capability as long as you don't require anything else. But um, a, a more interesting theorem would be to say we can now extend the system D to also give you an adaptive method of going from one leader election process to another. That's yet another kind of theorem. Okay, so these are just the potentials there. And once you start using them, then, you, then would be the point where you might want to also know what's the message traffic, how many messages to elect the leader and so forth. Okay, so that's the uh, theorem. And then what we do is decompose this the way we did for that simple handshake where we decomposed it into three lemmas. Here are four, five lemmas that um, are sufficient to prove leader. So if we have those five properties, we can build the leader election protocol. I won't go into them unless you want, but I'm happy to. I like them. I think they're really elegant. So for example, right here, first one just says everybody is going to vote, send the vote for itself to its neighbor. So that's clearly, now, now we're starting to get to the standard algorithm. So we say there will exist here an event that <clears throat> receives um, a vote for the predecessor. So on the output link from I, the, guy, the process sitting there, the neighbor of I, is going to receive a vote for his predecessor. Okay, so that's one of the conditions you want. And then we have uh, over here the condition. Um, oh, this, one's, uh, th this is the, the key clause that says, when you receive a user ID that's larger than yours, you will send it along. So this says you're going to then, then there'll be another action where you've sent the vote for that user ID onto its predecessor. So the point is you can write down these logical specifications, only five of them, 
that are enough to prove the theorem. So the theorem here would now be that we can uh, build this distributed system and we agree to let the maximum of the user IDs in the ring be the leader. And we now prove that that thing will be elected using those five properties and three trivial lemmas. Okay, so let me just switch to the uh, piece of code that comes out. We're, we're also really pleased with the way this gets organized, for example. We have little lemmas that say it's possible to send a message just once. There's another lemma called the trigger lemma that says a certain event will trigger another kind of event. So this whole thing gets proved by invoking very simple, obvious kinds of lemmas. And um, you're seeing most of the proof right there. And here is the automaton that gets generated. And again, you could break this down and find all the components of the five lemmas in there. Each clause of this machine is put into the mix from a lemma. So you can see the, um, the one that passes on the vote right here. That comes from the lemma number three that I showed you. So that little piece of the action there arises in the code from proving the lemma that was necessary for the argument. And this is the thing that we can translate automatically into Java, and I'd like to be able to do it into C Sharp. Notice that's really high level, abstract specifications. We could also put assertions in here as in Spec Sharp, and we could have those assertions automatically inserted from the proof. So what you would see is this asserted message automaton, and then the compilation into Java or into C Sharp introduces tons of code, by the way. It takes that thing and expands it to 400 lines of Java to get the job done. And then when you install it in the ring, you get a little demonstration of what the OK, so that's probably a good place to stop. I appreciate the questions from this audience. And uh, thank you for coming. Oh, we have some really hairy algorithms here that I don't lecture about because it would take the whole lecture. But we do have adaptive protocols that change adaptive consensus protocols. And we have several leader election protocols. We took the TIP leader election protocol, which is something that the Navy was wanting to verify, and did that, I think, in a pretty elegant way. Um, we're working. We're building up to the APSS security protocol, the um, asynchronous, proactive, secret sharing protocol. That's really hard. It's occupied us for the better part of two years. Because there, there has been no, no verification of it, we had to build a, a lot of machinery for that. At some point, we will be. <laughs> it's, it's hard to lecture about the really complicated things because it takes a couple of hours right, to explain all, all the mathematics. And I've, I've actually never seen anybody try to explain APSS even in a five-hour lecture with intuitive arguments. It's just hard. So we can, this gives you a, a sense of what we can achieve in a, an environment where you can at least see the argument is interesting. It's, it's a kind of thing you would teach uh, undergrads. The tip leader election is really quite interesting. And if you do it um, in more complicated data structures, the data structure reasoning gets, gets complex. But we can inject that in from our library of results about data structures.